So faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. Let me ask you, what are you hoping for? Because if you, see, faith can only work with your hope. So if you don't have a hope, a desire, a dream, a picture, faith has nothing to work with. It has to work with it. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. And you know, we go through life and we face all kinds of challenges and it's so easy, isn't it, to lose our hope, to lose our dream. You know, come on, you know, we start in our 20s, we're, we're full of energy, we're ready to go, but it's so easy, you know, to let life kick the stuffing out of you, isn't it? And so I want you to get your picture back. Let me ask you a question right now. What is your picture of your future? Do you, I, mean, I don't even think about my future. Pastor, I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to survive today. You know, I've been there. I know what it's like. But the Holy Spirit, the primary work is He wants to infuse you with a God-sized dream. He wants to visit your imagination and paint a picture of what your eye hasn't seen, your ear heard, or what you've experienced. All right, so we're going to get into uh, dreams and visions and uh, 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 the language of the, of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's what really is the secret to mountain moving faith. And uh, reminded of a story of this, uh, this, this man, he gets caught shoplifting. So he goes to stand before the judge and the, and the judge says to him, I understand you were caught shoplifting. He goes, yes, your honor. And uh, I understand you stole a can of peaches. Yes, sir. I stole a can of peaches. The judge says, all right, how many slices were in that can of peaches? The man says, your honor, there were five slices of peaches. So the judge said, okay, sir, I will sentence you to five weeks in jail, one week for every slice of peach. Thank you, your honor, thank you. And then the the wife put her hand up. She goes, your honor, may I say something? And the judge says, yes, ma'am, you you may speak. He goes, I just want you to know he also stole a can of peas. (laughs) All right, (laughs) Let's, let's turn to Acts chapter two. And uh, we're reading, and Acts chapter 2 is an amazing chapter because it's really the birth of the church. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came to infuse the church with the very presence of Jesus. Now, think about how, you know, important this day was. Previously, just a few nights before, uh, when Jesus, the night that he was... uh, crucified and, and abandoned and, and uh, delivered over, uh, he, he's talking to his disciples. And now these disciples have been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. Could you imagine walking with Jesus for three and a half years? And not only is he teaching and working miracles, he's coaching these disciples. He's correcting them when they're getting arrogant or, you know, when they're, they're getting hardness of heart. Jesus is like coaching them all the time. He's bringing out the best version of them, isn't he? When they started getting lifted up in pride and, you know, I want to sit on his right hand, I want to sit on the left, and they were arguing among themselves, who was the greatest of them, you know, jockeying for position and, you know, and kind of puffing up. Jesus talked about, you know, you've got to become like a little child and have the faith of a child. Could you imagine spending three and a half years with Jesus watching him work miracles? And then on this last night, Jesus says to them, look, guys, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit's not coming. But man, it's to your advantage, it's for to your profit that the Holy Spirit comes. I mean, I think about that, that, you know, three and a half years with Jesus in the flesh, and yet Jesus gives the promise, and it's available to all of us, that the personal ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life, in my life, is more profitable than having Jesus present with you in the flesh. I mean, that tells me a number, a number of things. Well, one of the things that I really want to key in on is telling me that we have not even begun to scratch the surface of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. For many denominations, the Holy Spirit is nothing more than a doctrinal statement. He's not a living person. He's not active in their churches. And he's not, you know, he's not working in the lives, you know, of the the believers or they don't acknowledge what he's doing. And so I want us as a church to get all in with what the Holy Spirit wants to do because it's to our advantage. Can I hear a good amen in this place? So 
so let's let's talk about this now on the day of pentecost there was 120 believers in the upper room and there was mary the mother of jesus she was there peter the first pope this is for my catholic friends and uh, we all know what happened was the holy spirit came down and baptized all of them and there was tongues of fire and all kinds of phenomena and they started to speak in tongues all 120 of them even mary the blessed virgin spoke in tongues and peter the first pope so you know this is not it's a joke you guys okay you know you guys get that, right? No. Okay, anyway, I, I will explain that later in my life. And so what happens then is that, you know, but the issue, the focus is not on the tongues that's happening, although that's a very normal and very, you know, um, uh, valid part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's the initial sign. And so it's the fastest growing movement in the world. There's somewhere about 700 million people that have been filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues today. It's a fast growing movement. But notice, I want us to focus in on the, pr on the prominent um, ministry of the spirit because Peter is now explaining this had never happened before people are like what is this are you and they, they see these 120 people guys walking around filled with joy speaking in other languages and everybody's kind of like these guys are drunk they're drunk on new wine nine o'clock in the morning and these followers of Jesus are drunk already what a disgrace so they're looking at these guys and I love how Peter responds he goes look these men are not drunk like you think yeah they're drunk but it's a different spirit it's not Jim Bean it's the Holy Spirit all right so he starts to unpack now and introduce because now the church is born and so the spirit has arrived and so now let's look what Peter says about the Holy Spirit reading from Acts chapter 2 verse 16 to 18 but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last days says God it's always good to know who's speaking this is God speaking and he says, these are the last days. How many know we've, we've been in the last days uh, since the day of Pentecost? It's been 2,000 days, but it's still the last days. And sometimes when you watch the news, you think, man, it's getting close. And he says, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Now, up until that time, the pouring out of the spirit or the anointing or the endowment for supernatural ministry was reserved for the kings, the prophets, and the priests. Only those three categories, and of course, you know, they, they were the only ones that could experience this empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so he goes on to say that I will pour, this is the promise of God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. How many of you got flesh today? How many got more than you really would like to have? Yeah, I know. Okay, but uh, notice what God says. This is, and he says this, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So now there's no distinction between male or female. Everybody gets in on the endowment or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That is good news. And all the women said, we knew that all along. Okay, and, it said, and he said, and you shall prophesy. Now this is a very important thing. So the first thing that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he wants you to prophesy. Now, what does that mean? Is that, that's not predicting the future. It's not, it's not, you know, foretelling. I know you always watch some of these, these guys on TV, these self-acclaimed prophets talking about, you know, prophesying about elections, prophesying about hurricanes and this and that. And they did a study on a lot of those TV guys. Let me tell you, their accuracy level is equal to that of a psychic, which is equal to somebody cold guessing. Yeah. I, I, I'm your pastor. I love you. I just want to protect you because a lot of these guys that are into that manipulation, they're trying to get into one thing, and that is your wallets. You know, they want you to buy their books. They want you to send their money. But I tell you, I'm sticking with the more sure word of prophecy called the written word of God. Come on, you can't go wrong with this book. So yeah. Anyway, so then, uh, but so it's not foretelling the uh, future events in as much as it's forthtelling. In other words, you shall prophesy, speak forth the plan that God has for you. God wants to visit your life, put his spirit upon you, and he wants to create a new picture, and he wants you to begin to talk differently. He wants you to begin to speak forth the caliber of life, come on, the bigness of life, the God-sized life, the God-authorized life that he has for you. He wants you to change the direction of your life because James says our tongue is like a rudder. A rudder can move that whole ship in the midst of a storm your tongue can change the direction of your life and the Holy Spirit wants to get a hold of your tongue because he wants to change the direction of your life come on you gotta speak it out first thing they shall prophesy 
Speak out God's plan. Speak out God's promise. Speak out the future that God has made for you. Speak it out and let your own ears hear your mouth speak so your heart can be filled with faith. They shall prophesy. And then he goes on to say, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. So here's the introduction to the personal ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing is, you're going to prophesy. The second thing is, you're going to find out if you're young or if you're old. If you're young, you have a vision. If you, if you got a dream, then you're old. Because old men are sleeping. You know, and so that's why they have dreams. But what I love about this, what I love about this and snoring, what I really love about this is that your old men will dream dreams. You know what? That's so, I get, I get encouraged by that. In other words, God has never finished enlarging your life. You know what? He's still visiting. You know, this is why I do not believe in retirement. I think retirement is from the pit. I refuse to retire. I will never retire. The day I retire is the day I die. I'm going to refire. I'm not going to retire. Listen, I'm not going to be doing this same thing every day. Obviously, my energy level is going to change when I hit about 95. I'll probably have to start slowing down a little bit. Hey, my friend Wayne Myers is 104. I got a newsletter from him this week. He goes, yeah, I'm back preaching twice a week. He's 104. <laughs> Moses, when he was 80, got the calling and the vision. Listen, this, listen, obviously, I think, you know, I think we do such a great disservice to our seniors. Instead of locking them up somewhere in some home, man, they've got the experience, the wisdom, the encouragement that the next generations need. We need to recognize that when you, you know, when, when you get to that level, you become a sage. You've got experience. You've got wisdom. You've got wisdom from the, the great things you've done, the things you've seen in life, and from your mistakes. And so we need your voice speaking to the next generation. Yeah, I did that. Don't do that. You know what? And, uh, we, need to, we need to learn from that. But I love the fact that God's never stopped giving visions and dreams to people. And I want to encourage you. Have you lost your dream? Have you lost your vision? Have you counted yourself out? Have you given up on the God idea for your life? Are you just settling for the mediocre? Are you just coming to church day in, day out as I do? I go to church, I go home, I eat chicken. You know, no. Listen, God wants to visit your life. And the first thing the Spirit wants to do is He wants to change the inner picture that you have. He wants to give you a God-shaped, God-authorized, God-sized vision. And He wants you to begin to speak it out. To the point where your neighbors are like, huh, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are going to be used by God? <laughs> yeah, you're going to prosper? <laughs> you're going to be the first one to break the alcohol addiction in your family? Yeah, right. Hey, with God, all things are possible. <laughs> you know, and what happens is we, we start to give up on our dreams and our visions, don't we? Because, you know what, we make mistakes. And we start thinking, well, man, yeah, it probably would have worked before I, before I really screwed up in my 20s. And now, you know what? God can never trust me and God can never use me again. You know, I love the story of Abraham. You know what? Because Abraham is such a great model of somebody who screwed up time after time after time. And yet God still fulfilled his promise to him. Think about it. Think about Abraham. God says, go to the land that I'll show you. So he goes there and he ends up going into Egypt. God never told him to go to Egypt, but he just went to Egypt. He gets to Egypt, and his wife is hot. At 65, she's still hot. And, uh, and so then Pharaoh looks at Sarah and says, I think I'll take her into my harem. Uh, goes to Abraham and says, who is she? And I love Abraham's answer. She's my sister. <laughs> um, come on. If I said that, I'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it says that Pharaoh treated, her, treated Abraham really well. Gave him a lot of livestock and cattle. He's like, this is a great deal. I get to live and I get to have more cows. That's awesome. Meanwhile, his wife, his wife is in a harem. And so God has to intervene to save Abraham's skin, you know. And that doesn't only happen once. It happens twice, you know. And then it's like, then they're not having kids. And it's an interesting verse because then Sarah says, you know, check out Hagar. You know, my, my young attendant there. The young servant girl, check, check her out. She's younger, you know, she's probably in her early 20s, you know, cute, whole thing. And why don't you go into her, have relations with her, and have a child with her? In the same verse, it says that Abraham had relations with her. The same, it's like, come on, think about that. Not a week of fasting and praying, 
not Lord. What do you want me to do with the same? Sarah says, have you thought about Hagar? Bam, he's in the sack, the same verse. Okay, I'm not encouraging or condoning any of Abraham's activity, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that even with all his mistake after mistake after mistake, God fulfilled his plan for Abraham. Why? He's not depending on the perfection of Abraham's behavior, but he's, God is depending upon his own, his own faithfulness and his ability to confirm the promise that he made over your life. So let me tell you, you have not made an era, you, you, you haven't changed your destiny, you haven't blown it, you haven't lost it, because God is the God of the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance, the fifth chance. Come on, stick with God. So, Okay, we gotta, gotta get into our message now. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about prayer. We're talking about the secret of mountain moving faith. Talk about the prayer that moves mountains. Now there's, there's two levels of prayer. And so one is the, there's the communion level and the other one I call the task level. So I love the communion level of prayer, right? That's when I, I spend time, I wake up in the morning, I grab my Bible, I grab my coffee and I start, start, I start spending time with God. I'm not trying to get anything from God, but I'm just, I'm just being with him. I'm just thanking him for what he's done in my life. And I, I read some scriptures. I'm not trying to get my sermon for, for Sunday. I'm just spending time with God because I want to spend time with my father and I want to be in his presence. And I, I just want to hear his voice speak to me. I just, I have communion. And so what do I do? I'll, I'll read some scripture. I'll meditate on what I'm hearing. And then I'll probably pace. I'll probably walk around my dining room table. I do a little, little, little walk because I'm a kinetic learner. And I'm saying, God, I just thank that you are my father. Thank you, God, that you are my father. And uh, I thank you that I've been, I'm born of God. And whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even my faith. Thank you, Father, that you've, you've given me a faith that overcomes the world. Father, I thank you that I've been born not of the will of man or the will of flesh, but the will of God. I'm born again because you chose me. God, when nobody ever saw anything in me, when nobody ever would have chosen me, God, you chose me. And you chose me not on the basis of my performance, but you chose me before the foundations of the earth. Before there was an earth, you were thinking about me. You designed me and you loved me. God, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for your incredible love. Thank you that you called me according for your purpose and grace. Grace because you knew I was going to mess up. And grace because you knew I couldn't live this life on my own. I needed your strength and your grace in my life. And I begin to thank God. And I just do something like that. And I just begin to worship. I, I'm not asking God for anything. I'm just thanking him. And the more I thank him, the more I get tuned in to his presence. The more I get tuned in to his plan. The more the peace of God. This is communion. Communion means you're coming into union. Communion, come into union. I'm just connecting with God in a sweet, intimate, beautiful way. And it just sets my day up for I can take on anything if I started my day with Jesus. Right? I'm just beginning to thank him. You know, so, so start there. Start with that communion prayer. The second level of prayer I call task prayer. Now that's where we start to pray on the next part of like the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love that sign we have out there. It says, in Calgary, as it is in heaven. This is where we start, you know, speaking things out. This is where we start, you know, you know whatever it is that's, uh, that needs, to, needs the uh, intervention of God. We begin to thank God. God, I thank you. And what is, and what is the kingdom of God? Because he's taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not everything that's happening in your life is the will of God. I know there is a, you know, a dimension of the church there, the very demented, that believe everything is the will of God. And, and I do not believe that. I don't believe, sickness is not the will of God. Tragedy is not the will of God. These are, poverty and curse is not the will of God. Never. Now, can God work in those things? Always. But we got to know, that's why the Bible says to give thanks in all things. So we can give thanks in those things, but I'm not giving thanks for those things. You know, and so I start thanking God. I just start, God, I thank you. Thy will be done on earth. And I start with this piece of earth right here. I say, God, in my life, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth, this earth. Start with me. God, your will be done done in my life is it is in heaven as your will is done in heaven so be it in my life not my will not the will of my flesh not the will of my fantasy not the will of my fears but your will God be 
down in my life. And then, I, and then I enlarge my circle. I include Madeline. God, in our marriage, I thank you. And then I enlarge my kids. I bring my kids in there. And then, right, then I start bringing uh, the church family. God, I thank you. And I, could you imagine if we all start praying like that? And what is, what is the kingdom of God? In Romans, it says, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, what a good way to pray. So that's, that's the second level of prayer. And so I want to talk to you. I want to give you some secrets about how we enter into mountain-moving faith with the power of the Spirit. So is this helping anybody this morning? All right. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible because some of you are really hard of hearing. So I need to amplify it. Now faith, we've been, we've been camping on this verse because this is the biblical definition of faith. Now faith is. Faith is always in the present tense. Hope is always in the future tense. Hope is that future picture, that dream, that desire, that imagination. By the way, in in the Hebrew, uh, the word imagination and meditation are identical. So anyway, that's another message. Now faith is the confirmation, the title deed. Faith is a confirmation. You know, it's not just, it's not an understanding mentally. Sometimes I don't understand what God is doing in my life. I look at some circumstances. I don't understand it, but I have the confirmation in here. Faith is a confirmation. I just know in my knower, right? And, uh, you know, because we, we lean not on our own understanding, but we trust in the Lord with all our heart. So faith is a confirmation in here. It's an inner witness. It's the spirit giving you that confirmation. It's like, come on, I order something from Amazon. What do you get? A confirmation email. And the same thing. I put my order, my request into heaven. God, this is what I need. And all of a sudden, uh, the spirit gives me an inner confirmation. It's right there. Yeah, I got it. Now up here, I don't see it. I don't feel it. I don't touch it. But I got the confirmation. So I know it's on its way. So don't give up because your dream is still on its way. So faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. Let me ask you, what are you hoping for? Because if you see, faith can only work with your hope. So if you don't have a hope, a desire, a dream, a picture, faith has nothing to work with. It has to work with it. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. And, you know, we go through life and we face all kinds of challenges. And it's so easy, isn't it, to lose our hope, to lose our dream. You come on, you know, we start in our 20s, we're we're full of energy, we're ready to go. But it's so easy, you know, to let life kick the stuffing out of you, isn't it? And so I want you to get your picture back. Let me ask you a question right now. What is your picture of your future? I mean, I don't even think about my future. Pastor, I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to survive today. You know, I've been there. I know what it's like. But the Holy Spirit, the primary work is he wants to infuse you with a God-sized dream. He wants to visit your imagination and paint a picture of what your eye hasn't seen, your ear heard, or what you've experienced. Come on, some of you have come from such heartbreak, some brokenness, family brokenness, maybe long lines of addiction or poverty or curses or all kinds of negativity. The Holy Spirit wants to give you a new hope, a dream. The psalmist said, I would have fainted unless I believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you don't get that picture, it's easy to faint. It's easy just to go through the motions. And so the Holy Spirit wants to visit you. And let me ask you, what's what's your picture for your marriage? What do you believe in God for? What what do you see? What do you see right now? Uh, uh, You're just going to survive the day. You know, as long as we didn't fight today, we did good. You know, do do you see you guys growing together, laughing together, even on your rocking chairs? Like, I'm not getting a rocking chair. I'm going to get one of those motorized scooters with a turbo. (laughs) Like, we're going to be racing. Madeline and I, we're going to be racing. Now, we're going to be we're going to be healthy and strong because I'll be winning. She's very competitive, and if I when I win, she's a poor loser. And uh, so. We're not going to do that. So anyway, but what, what's your picture? What do you see for your kids? Come on, what, what, are, you, what are you looking at? You know, what are you seeing? Because, because faith is what takes it from being uh, the things unseen, the things hoped for. The faith takes it from the realm of imagination, the realm of the invisible, and gives substance to it and brings it into your reality today. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What are you hoping for? Because faith will make it a reality. Wow. Then he goes on to say, 
and the conviction of their reality. Uh, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. It's the proof of things we don't see. Faith has to do with what you don't see with the realm of the invisible. All right. So with that verse, I want to share with you three things, three substances, uh, three vital qualities of this kind of faith. So number one is this. You must have a clear goal. Write this down. You must have a clear goal. And why do I say write this down? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. Because number one, you've got to register your faith. It's something about writing it down. I think it was Stanford University did a study, a uh, university study, where they, they uh, uh, questioned all these students and they said, you know, what do you want to do in life? And uh, they wrote it all down. And they noticed only 3% of them wrote down that vision. So everybody else said, yeah, I'm going to do this, going to do that. But only 3% wrote down a clear goal. They went back 20 years later to find out how did these people make out. And they found out that only 3% of them had achieved their goals. Can you guess which 3% they were? It was the ones that wrote it down. Habakkuk chapter 2 says this, uh, verses 1 to 4. I will stand on my watch and set myself on the ramparts and watch to see what he will say to me. And what I, will, what I will answer when I am corrected. And then the Lord answered and said to me, write the vision, make it plain that he who runs may read it. And so I like that. Write the vision, make it plain. Even God says, write the vision, make it plain. So write it down. Be, be defined. Because defined prayers get definite answers. Vague prayers get vague answers. So I remember when I, when I was traveling and, and taking teams over to India... We used to take teams from Sweden and Canada with a preacher I used to work for. And uh, I mean, it was so cool because I'd watch these, I watched the Canadians and the Canadians are, they're praying, early morning prayer meeting. They're kind of like stumbling around, you know, mumbling, don't like the food, mm, stomach hurts, God, mm, mm, bless that tree, Lord. You know, they were kind of unfocused and just meandering. And then I'd watch these crazy Swedes. Like it was a really amazing move that was happening in Sweden in the 80s among what they call the free churches. And I'd watch the way these Swedes would get together and they would get in a huddle and they'd start praying and they were like yelling and they were intense. And then they, they, they would finish their prayers with this, uh, this thing where they would all shout, Ye Sunam! And they would, like, in Jesus' name, and then they would do a karate chop. And I, thought, and I thought, these people are wild, you know. And so I really got excited about these Swedes. Like, who would you want to be connected with? Oh, Swedes. So I remember I was traveling around Sweden, and I was preaching this one church, and the pastor said, Anthony, you need to get married. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I was, I'm, I'm going to do that. I was thinking of getting married to, a, you know, a, a, a nice Calabrese Italian girl. Um, you know, that's what I thought. I had a picture of a spirit-filled Calabrese, you know, part of my family, but without the mustache. And uh, I thought that, that would be really good, you know. But then when I was in Sweden, I thought, you know what, I, 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 I kind of like these Swedes. And so he says, write it down in my guest book. What, you, you know, what do you want from God? So I, I grabbed the guest book and I, and I wrote, okay, key, uh, I'm looking for uh, 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 a girl. And uh, he goes, get more, define, what do you want? You know, and I said, uh, well, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. Come on, come on, I'm Italian. Blonde, blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, I want her to be a, a two-year graduate of the Word of Life Bible College. I want her to have a call for missions. I want her to love souls. And, uh, and uh, I want her to be 170 centimeters tall because I'm 164. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like an Al Pacino, Cameron Diaz kind of thing going on there. Come on, that's hot. And uh, so I, I, I wrote that down. And, and really, part of that is, is because I... Uh, I'm already the tallest in my family, and so I was thinking if I marry someone a little bit taller, I can get some of those Viking genetics into my family line. I mean, there's nothing more dangerous than Italians, but tall Viking DNA Italians. Look out, world, you know. So, my kids, you are very welcome. You should thank your mom for putting up with a short guy. Okay. And uh, so, anyway, so on my, on my reception, after, you know, it's like when I, so I, I go to India, and I see this girl, and I'm thinking, blonde hair? Mm-hmm. Blue eyes? Check, right? Two years. I said, you go to Bible school? Yeah. Two years, word of life. Okay. Two years, word of life. Check. You love missions? That's why I'm here, stupid. Okay. All right. Love missions. <laughs> and then, and then I was, one day, I was watching her. Her and this guy named Connie were witnessing to the chef who's preparing the food for us. So he's out, you know, we're outdoor, and he's got this big pot of curry, and he's cooking, and they're, they're, they're witnessing to him, and, and they lead him to Jesus. 
And uh, then they, they pray for him to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he starts to speak in tongues. And when he does, his false teeth fly out of his mouth and land right in the curry. I thought, wow, that's the girl for me. I'm marrying that woman. So on my wedding... On my wedding reception, that pastor from Sweden, he brings the guest book and he kind of, he read everything that I'd written down. Listen, you, faith works with a clear goal. What? Get, bring clarity to your vision. Spend time with God and let the Holy Spirit begin to write on the canvas of your heart, what do you want from God? I like that. Jesus walks up to a blind man. What is it that you want me to do for you? Uh, I'd like a bike. No, the guy's blind. Of course Jesus knows that he's blind. But it's like God is saying, come on, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want me to do for you? God is saying, what do you want? I'm like, (laughs) are you hearing me? Come on, he's the ultimate dream giver. Get your hope back. Get your life back. Get a vision back. So the first thing is have a clear cut goal. Number two is you've got to have a burning desire. You got, you got to pray from that place of intensity. I love what Jesus said. He said, when, when you pray, you know, whatsoever, whatsoever things you desire. Someone say desire. Shout it. Desire. desire. Someone say desire. desire. It doesn't say preference. Desire. What's desire? It's a passionate, you know, uh, it's a passionate unction. It's a, it's a passionate desire. It's, it's a fixing of a goal. You pray from fire. You pray from fervency. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man makes much power available. What is it that consumes you? What is it? Well, I, you know, so many times we just pray from, you know, a place of just apath- apathy or just complacency. But you want to get to that place. No, this is what I want. It's like Gideon, like, uh, not Gideon, but like uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb. They said, God, give us that mountain. We want that. Listen, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What's your desire? Well, I, I don't want to bother God. He's your father. No good thing will he withhold from you. How will he that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? God is saying, come alive. What do you want? Like we're singing that song about, I will sing of the goodness of God. I like that song. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. God is looking for you. He wants to show up big in your life. So what's the first thing? First thing, you've got to be defined. Be clear. What's your goal? Write it down. Number two, pray from intensity. Don't let it be just a passing, momentary, fleeting fantasy. Lock into it. Get bulldog ugly with your faith. Yeah. You know why the bulldog's nose is slanted, eh? Because so when he bites into something, he can still breathe because he ain't letting go. Get bulldog ugly faith. Slant your nose back, bite into the promise of God, and hold on for dear life. And the third thing is you've got to learn to commune with the Holy Spirit. You know to commune, Amos 3.3 says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? You've got to get into agreement with the Holy Spirit. He's got to be more than a doctrinal statement. He must be a present, living reality, your best friend, your partner, your senior partner. Come on, your comforter, your counselor, your strengthener, your standby. You've got to learn to develop that relationship. Everything you experience today is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is present. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is Paul's benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I like that. The communion, what's that? Coming into union. Let me tell you, if you're going to walk in union with the Holy Spirit, you've got to be agreed. And let me tell you, you know, you've got to speak his language. It's beautiful when you understand each other's language. When you know your partner's love language, whether it's physical touch or affection or quality time or, you know, or, or, or verbal affirmation, you know what? You get, to, you get in sync when you start speaking each other's language, right? When I went to Sweden and I learned Swedish, I could converse freely with the Swedish chef. I know everything he says when he's cooking on the Muppets. You know, you, okay, that's, he's not speaking Swedish. It's Norwegian. And, uh, but, but, you know, you... If you're going to experience mountain-moving faith, you've got to learn to commune with the Holy Spirit. And let me say, when you you know you're communing with the Holy Spirit, when you begin to speak His language, 
And dreams and visions are the language of the Holy Spirit. When you spend time with the Holy Spirit, He gives you dreams. He gives you vision. He gives you hope. He gives you picture. And when you begin to see it, then from a place of authority, you prophesy. You speak it out with a substance, with an authority, because the Spirit is upon you. Are you catching this? It says that in the beginning, the earth was without form, was in a chaotic state, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters. And then God said, let there be, and bam, the Spirit came into action. I believe the Spirit is hovering over your life, waiting for you to take that place of authority and begin to speak out. I mean, and God, he has to be, yet working with Abraham, who was making all those mistakes. He had to elevate Abraham into that realm of communion where he begins to dream and begins to see it, not from his own personal perspective, because he says, God, what's going to happen to me? I'm almost 100 years old now, and, you know, I've been waiting for this promised son for all these years. I, I, it's, I don't know what's going on, God. I, he starts getting discouraged, and in Genesis 15, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, no, indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then he, look at this, then God brings him outside. And he said, look now toward heaven count the stars what is god doing to abraham he's trying to get him to commune with the holy spirit the dream giver come on come outside look count the stars count the stars and he says and he says uh, count the stars if you're able to number them and he said so shall your descendants be and he believed the lord and he's counting from righteousness pray from that vision you know i i, I love you know look i think of abraham's life you know, you go to a parade, you see each float go past you, one at a time, you see it linear, you're looking at it, and it's like a, just one event after another in succession, you sit there. But you know what, God is like up in the helicopter looking down, He sees the beginning of the parade, He sees the end of the parade. God is outside of the space-time continuum, and He looks, He sees the end of your life, He sees the beginning of your life. And so God looks at Abram, who just, you know, was struggling at 100 years old, didn't have any kids, and God looked at the end of his life and said, yeah, yeah, I, I fulfilled my promise to Abraham, and he became a father of multitudes. And so God, he declares the end, the end from the beginning. And so God says to Abraham, don't worry, Abraham, I've made you a, a father of many nations. Why? Because from God's perspective is ultimate truth and reality. From Abraham's perspective, it's my truth. Baloney, that was your limited, puny perspective. It's time to let your truth die the death of a thousand screams. Come up to God's truth and let God declare your end from the beginning. And God says, you're a blessed people. Wow. I take God's truth because God's perspective is better than mine. I only see this much. I see this much of my life. And what, I'm going to base my whole future on this life? No, I'm going to step out of this life. I'm going to start walking with God, communing with God. God, how do you see my life? Anthony, I see you as a mighty champion. I see you like a tall Viking. I see you going into the nations. I see crowds of hundreds of thousands coming to Christ. Bible schools being established. Churches being established. I see Calvary Life Church expand to many different locations and cities. I, that's what I see. But, but I, I would be so puny if I'm just trusting in my own understanding. And so I've got to let the Holy Spirit take that picture of what God finishes with our lives and he comes with that vision and says Anthony eat this eat this eat this and he's, and he's jamming it into my heart and I'm like God it's so far beyond me yeah it is beyond you that's why you need me you can't do it on your own it's God's size not Anthony's size come on <laughs>